macroeconomics lesson. Let's say that this is a representative economy, these 10 people right here. Uh, I'll be the entrepreneur. They're all the potential workers. So they come to work for me. They earn a salary from me. Uh, they go out and use that salary to buy the goods and services that they made at my factory, and I profit from that. Now, there's, in this example, there's no government, and there's no foreigners, so it's every Texan's dream, all right? And the way this works is, let's say, however, and this is critical, that we don't need all 10 people to produce enough goods, goods and services for all 10 people. Let's say that seven people can make enough for 10, and that three of those people are redundant, all right? Three of those people, we can make enough goods and services for them, but we don't need them to participate in the process of making goods and services uh, in order to make enough for them as well. And, and, and also, now if I'm the entrepreneur here, I'm not gonna make enough for 10 people then, am I? Because there's no point. Only seven people can buy enough uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, have the income to buy goods and services, so I'm not even going to hire those seven people. I'm going to lay some people off who would otherwise have been producing the goods and services for the three redundant people, and I'm going to make the math real simple here. I don't know why one person was making enough for the three other people, but let's just say they were. So I lay off one more person, all right? So now we're in a situation where we've got the four involuntarily unemployed people, who they don't have the income to purchase the goods and services we can already afford to produce. I've got the one entrepreneur, which is me, who is content, but I'd be happier if sales were higher. And we've got the six willing workers who, who do have jobs, but um, they're, they're paying some sort of cost for unemployment. I mean, I, either uh, Uncle Bob is living with us again, or, or Mom got stabbed at the 7-Eleven again, or you know, something like that in terms of the cost of, of the unemployment. Now, let me put this in sort of a historical context. I asked my students, what was different between the 20s? I mean, look at the average rates of unemployment here during the 20s. The, the what 20s? Roaring 20s. <laughs> we all know that, the roaring 20s. Uh, and in fact, from like, the first two years were recessionary, but after that we got 4.24% unemployment, an average rate of GDP growth of 4.89. And then look what happens next. Uh, an average unemployment rate from 1930 to 1941 of 17.23. I don't know if you were paying attention, but that is higher than the previous slide, uh, where it was 4.98. So, and uh, uh, average GDP growth the first three years when the, when the uh, recession really hit of negative 8%. Now, what was different? I mean, did we have less productive capacity in the 30s? Was there, there a, 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 a big fire that burned down all the factories? Or did people forget how to make stuff? Uh, was there a, you know, an aliens attack from outer space or something like that? No, I mean, we had the productive capacity in the 1930s to produce not only as much as we did in the 20s, but more. Because the 1930s were a long period of, of, of uh, buildup in physical capital. We should have been, in the 1930s, the greatest economic period in, in U.S. history. Uh, but instead, of course, you can see what the unemployment rates did, right? So, point being, that I think that this, uh, this, this sort of background story of we have the capacity, and I think that's what is lost on a lot of people. We have the capacity right now, there's no question that we have the capacity to have an unemployment rate that, you know, the same as we had, say, six years ago, around 4.4% uh, with 6 million fewer unemployed people. There's no reason we can't be there. There's not some fundamental constraint that is keeping us from being able to produce at that same level, just as in a far more dramatic example, there was absolutely no reason whatsoever from a physical productivity standpoint, from a standpoint of, you know, could we make the stuff that we couldn't have had the same standard of living, in fact, a better one, no question, a better one during the Great Depression than we did during the 20s. And those numbers are just unbelievable. Uh, look, we, we, uh, unemployment is as low as 1.9% in 1926, 32 in 29, up to 87, and, and rising as high as 24.9. And of course, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, what did they try to do in 1937? Uh, well, well, gosh, the worst of the recession's over. Uh, let, let's try to balance the budget. Uh, and, and that worked out really well, as you can see. Um, that, uh, that, that, uh, hopefully history will not repeat itself. And so there's this sort of secular trend where you have the rising productivity making it harder and harder in a market economy to generate sufficient demand to hire everybody that's willing to work because it gets easier and easier to produce output with fewer chunks of people. And so, as a consequence, it is not profitable. We have the physical capacity to produce those goods and services, but it is not profitable to produce those goods and services. Because remember, let me jump back to the slide over here. 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's that one. I've got the capacity as the entrepreneur to produce for all those people, but it is not profitable to produce for all those people. I have no, there's no reason, and I'm not, a, I'm not a jerk. I have a family. You know, I run this factory here. I, I'm not running a charity. You know, so I'm not going to hire those other four people when, in fact, I cannot sell the output that they would produce. Right? So, as a consequence, and the sort of long-term problem, and of course, this is where the, the, de the deficit's going to, again, jump in here. And both the cyclical and the long-term problem of keeping demand high enough to hire everybody who is willing to work. And again, you have to keep pounding this into your head. You keep remembering, we have the capacity to produce the goods and services. That's not the problem. All right? We have the ability to do it. This is what we did in the 30s. So, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to, to supplement that demand. And, however, in the midst of a recession, of course, businesses and households are not in a position to do that. Right? They, they can't do it. Uh, and I, I, I put that in parentheses there. Uh, that uh, Rohan was asking me to talk a little bit about the collective action problem, and I'm not quite sure this really fits. Um, but, but it is interesting to think about. You know, everyone would be better off if they all spent more money. But if you did so individually, you'd be worse off. All right? If you as an entrepreneur decided, well, what the heck, I'll, I'll start up a couple more restaurants uh, and, and take a chance, then you'll probably lose. But if everyone did at the same time, you might generate sufficient demand. But, but I, don't, I think it's more fundamental than that. We just didn't need any more restaurants. All right? We just didn't need any more. And so, what sector do we have left? Well, we could do as the uh, you know, Chinese do and use the foreign trade to support demand in our country, or we can use the government. All right? We can use the government. And let's do that. Let's make those 10 people again, and let's make the last three a police officer, a marine, and a teacher. All right? And we'll, for now, we'll just we'll print up some money. Print up a pile of money and hand it to them. Right? Uh, and obviously, it's an economic problem to decide how much money we should give them. Uh, but I think that's something that would keep economists in work, and it could, it's uh, manageable. Uh, so they now have the income to go to the store and make profitable the production of stuff we could already produce. All right. We could already produce it, now they make it profitable. And furthermore, of course, what's going to happen to the person that's still redundant right now? Well, now I, as the entrepreneur, have to hire him back. Like, oh, hell, I can, sp I can sell more stuff. So I'm going to go and hire that last person back uh, because now I can profitably produce output for 10 people, whereas I could not before. So the net effect is the three people who had been unnecessary now have the income necessary to purchase the output. We always have the ability to produce. The person that I laid off gets hired again. I've got higher sales. And those who already had jobs gave up nothing. All right, they gave up nothing. There is a free lunch when we're at less than full employment, right? If we're not at less than full employment, if we're in the middle of World War II and unemployment you know, is, is, is 2% and the government tries to expand um, spending, then yeah, we're going to have to take, we're going to have to have rationing, we're going to have the government capturing more resources for itself, we're going to have potentially inflation unless we have things like uh, wage and price controls, uh, but you know, we're not in a situation like that right now. When we have unemployed resources, then yes, there is a free lunch, and, oh yeah, they, they gave up nothing, they no longer carry the burden of the unemployed, they're protected against domestic and foreign aggression, and you can send your kids to school if you want to, for public education. Of course, I teach at a private school too, so I think that's a really bad idea. Private school. 